Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Elisa Baum and I'm Percona's Director of Product Marketing. We'll begin in just one moment, but first I'd like to conduct some house cleaning. If you wouldn't mind, could you please raise your hand using the hand icon located in the control panel to let me know that you can hear me. Thank you, I see lots of hands, that's great. Next, during this webinar, you will be on mute. Should you have any questions at all during the discussion today, just go ahead and enter them in the questions field within the GoToWebinar control panel. At the end of the webinar, we'll take time to answer as many questions as possible, and those that aren't addressed will be answered in a follow-up blog post on Preconer's MySQL performance blog. In addition, I'll make sure that everybody has a recording of this webinar in the next 48 hours, as well as links to the slides. With that said, I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar called Running MySQL on Linux, and it's presented by Percona's CEO and founder, Peter Zaitsev. So with that, I'll turn the floor over to Peter. Go ahead, Peter. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Yes. And uh, oh, the goal of this presentation is uh, we'll try to provide a very brief overview, but cover uh, all the components, all the things you need to know to run MySQL on Linux successfully. Now, one question uh, you may have, or you may need to, to be able to convince your boss, is why do you really want to uh, run MySQL on Linux? Well, and uh, the best answer is perhaps is what that's what the uh, majority of people out there do, and there is a lot of safety in numbers, right? Because there is a lot of knowledge available on uh, on the Linux, there is a lot of experience, and uh, frankly, it uh, it works pretty well. Uh, we did a poll uh, in uh, the end of the last year, and we found uh, among my school performance blog readers some 90% of users run, uh, use Linux for productions and 80% uh, for developers, which are uh, very high numbers. Now also if you uh, uh, hear about a lot of the high profile MySQL installations, being that on Facebook, uh, being that on uh, Twitter or Google, most likely they wouldn't even mention the operation system of their run because well, <laughs> that is a Linux by default uh, those days. So I would say unless you have some very good reason uh, not to do that, uh, Linux is a very good and uh, safe choice for uh, as an operating system for, uh, for, for MySQL. Now Linux is not just one operating system. In fact, it is a lot of different distributions which you can choose. And um, many of them uh, work uh, pretty well. What I would be looking from distribution is to look for server-grade distribution, which is directed on the server usage, not desktop, and which is focused around stability and long-term support. Chances are your database uh, server will be humming alone for a number of years and you don't uh, want to be forced to do a very major operating system upgrade just because you are, uh, it's no more updated and you're not even getting the security updates. You also want to, to have an operating system which is uh, recent enough, especially if you are running uh, new hardware because new operation systems uh, have a lot better support for new hardware in particular. Right. Well, for example, uh, if you are uh, using solid state drives and you want support for trim, which is very important for uh, the efficiency, then you want to run the, uh, the little, uh, some of the latest uh, serial grade distributions. From our observation, the most popular distributions what we see out there, this is Red Hat Enterprise in base distributions, the Red Hat Enterprise in its proper, CentOS, Oracle Linux, uh, Scientific Linux, and uh, etc., as well as uh, Debian, Debian and uh, Ubuntu, again in uh, the LTS variant. One thing you need to uh, know with Linux uh, is what the hardware those days can go a long way. 
And uh, a lot of your performance and scaling problems on the medium level can be just uh, used by uh, using proper hardware. If you think about how far uh, hardware can go, uh, it is really amazing. Uh, you can get something like 200,000 of simple queries a second on a single modern MySQL server. Uh, there, uh, the new MySQL versions of our hardware, uh, we have seen reports uh, getting as much as a half a million of queries per second. So that can be tremendous. Right? Now, if you look at this number and we say, well, we have uh, some typical replication, you know, having some reasonable number of queries per second, little queries per page of, let's say, 100 of uh, uh, queries per page. Uh, and uh, in this case, even accounting for uh, your typical daily traffic variance, you will be looking at some 80 million of page views a day, which can be supported by the simple MySQL server installation. This is, of course, not the numbers of Facebook or Twitter, or Twitter and That is still a pretty uh, impressive number you may be able to get. Now, when we look at the hardware and what is really their uh, most important uh, for us, there are a few components to consider. First is their CPUs. With CPUs, I would recommend to go for faster cores, uh, everything being equal. And um, the reason for that is uh, you often uh, will not uh, be able to use all the cores uh, effectively, but you will have some bad jobs, replication, and probably other MySQL activities which need uh, will be running essentially on the one uh, on the single core. And I think this becomes uh, more and more important those days because uh, now often uh, the vendors will be doing some measurements and showing price performance numbers and coercing you in all different ways to, to buy CPUs which have a lot more cores but at a lot lower frequency, which is often not a good choice for MySQL workflow. It may be a good choice for some other workflow as well. Memory. Memory is, you know, for many applications, the very important for, uh, for performance. Because if you are, uh, go, have to go to the disk for majority of your queries, it really doesn't matter how fast your CPUs are. Right? So even before the CPU comes, ensuring what your working set right, uh, fits in memory. And that means you don't have to go to uh, disk that often, so your workload will be more on the CPU bound side, not on the I bound side. You also have to consider here what memory and the I O subsystem are very much uh, related. The more memory you have, the less pressure there will be on your I O subsystem, right? And essentially, uh, uh, less powerful I O subsystem you will need to have. When you talk about the I/O subsystem and uh, storage, if we are looking for mm, flash, uh, if you're looking for uh, highest performance storage, uh, I will be looking at the enterprise-grade PCA Express cards. They are the fastest you can get, right? From number of IOPS, they will be faster than uh, the most powerful RAID arrays or Sun uh, instance you can get. Uh, Fusion IO. Uh, Viridant, uh, Micron, these are some of their uh, vendors which produce a very good uh, quality high performance cards. Now, if uh, you are looking at some uh, more uh, cost efficient solutions, I would be looking at the solid state uh, drives which are uh, attached to a serial ATA interface. Those uh, things become very uh, effective and you can get a drive which is well below one dollar per gigabyte, which is uh, very good uh, cost numbers. If you're going for low cost solid state drives, uh, essentially, I would uh, suggest you to mine two things. First, vendors uh, matter. We have seen some uh, solid state drive, uh, drive vendors which uh, would have some stalls and uh, non uniform performance in our way uh, because, well, uh, they have some problems with uh, server-grade workloads. They are more geared towards your uh, 
desktop workloads, you also may be limited by the wear, not by uh, actually performance of the drive, because a lot of uh, their inexpensive drives, they have a relatively low uh, amount of writes they can handle. And if you write as fast as possible as the drive can, can support, it will wear out essentially in, in the month, right? So keep that in mind uh, for your workloads. Now, if you're not ready for solid state yet and you're using conventional drives, it's very important what you have ready the battery backup unit or uh, essentially a secure RAID back cache and uh, uh, as such. In terms of RAID configuration, RAID 10 is an uh, obvious good default recommendation for heavy workloads. While that's not only the RAID uh, uh, you may want to use. For example, if you are uh, having the slaves which you are using for analytics uh, uh, and which are significantly uh, read bound and discardable, RAID 5 can be well a pretty default choice. Or if you're looking for uh, RAID volume for your operation system, uh, RAID 1 is uh, quite helpful. When you're looking at your performance, you also want to understand what your goals are in terms of storage from your workload. Are you read bound? Are you write bound? Are your reads and writes sequential or random? Do you need to have sustained writes uh, at a high volume or is your writes more, uh, more spiky? The former, uh, this last one is especially important for solid state drives which often have a quite a quite complex logic uh, inside and their sustained write performance may be very different from the spikes where uh, ready to absorb. What can currently do plan your system to operate for? Many devices may publish very high IO numbers out there in the specs and the benchmarks, but those numbers are only reachable at very high concurrency. Something like, oh, at 100 threads or 200 outstanding IOPS, which may not be what you will be reaching at your MySQL workload, right? And so they will perform a lot lower than you would uh, expect. Also think about the response latency and response time. I have seen so many uh, uh, people showing me their, bench, uh, their spec numbers for their NAS and SUN installations which are connected to a network, uh, only to be very much surprised uh, what those come with pretty high latency because of all the network overhead. Now let's talk uh, more about the performance uh, with memory. This is where uh, graph uh, what we did uh, one of the benchmarks with uh, um, the different amounts of, of, of memory. And what you can see in this case is first Increasing amount of memory does not provide the very substantial benefit. Then uh, you can see as your working set starts to feed the memory better and better, uh, you have small uh, additions of memory provide disproportionately right performance boost. And then in certain cases it essentially levels out, right, or um, uh, something like that. Uh, if uh, if you have a chance. It's very good to have your system somewhere at the point A. Then you have uh, realized the benefit of uh, fitting uh, the, your working sets uh, in memory. Now, what is also interesting is uh, uh, what we can have something which is called, which I call as a compression of, uh, of performance gains uh, for different storage systems. If you look at those graphs, which are done for common RAID 10 array, uh, the Intel SSD, which is medium performance, right, the solid state system and Fusion IO, which is a uh, pretty high performance system, you can see uh, what on the, when we have our workload significantly IO bound, then in this case there is a lot of difference out there, right, it may be uh, many times between the slowest uh, and no. Uh, the faster. And at the same time, as we get more and more to fit in work and set in memory, those gains, uh, they compress, right? There is a less and less uh, difference between very high performance system and a slower system, right? So the point in this case 
uh, to illustrate is uh, the more memory you have, the less uh, you know, powerful I/O subsystem you may uh, need to have. And depending on the amount of data you have, you may uh, choose. You may have your most efficient investment being either your storage system or you know, or your memory. Now there is also, of course, a lot of other things to consider. This is a real benchmark, so you often will have to have certain uh, a lot of writes in your system, which may uh, always produce substantial amount of IOs or uh, whatever amount of memory you have. The next thing I want to talk about is is a little bit more advanced when it comes to storage configuration, and it is called uh, alignment. If you uh, think about that, they're uh, internally the storage mm, organized in a way so it can serve best if your IOPS are aligned to certain internal boundaries, which is you know would be sector size, which is often 4K for, for uh, normal workloads or even uh, even larger ones. Uh, now. If you don't uh, have it uh, partition and file system aligned properly, then and even though it's not multiple times, right, it's a matter of percent, it is a performance loss you get without gating anything. And with a few ways to align your file system and partition properly, uh, you will get essentially a free, uh, free performance loss. This is uh, is an example. What you can see in this case is uh, uh, if you are looking at uh, requests uh, to, per second, the more threads we have, the more important alignment may uh, may need uh, may need to be right. And you can see uh, that what there is a very little difference on the one thread that it goes supposed to be much higher at 16 and uh, 32 threads. Uh, and then I provided a couple of links which uh, provide the information how you can uh, analyze uh, and see where your alignment is set properly and what is a way to, uh, to set up alignment. Uh, the next component which will impact your system very importantly is network. And for network, you have to understand what the latency is a king. Right? I see it's very uh, rarely then we really run for uh, out of network bandwidth for normal database operations. There are some applications which have that, but it's uh, in minority. Uh, majority of applications would suffer because of uh, pure latency. So what do we want to do to minimize our network latency? Well, first, you want to minimize number of hops between your database and the web server. Right? Having some a few switches and router in between, even in the same uh, data center, may add another millisecond uh, or so, and that actually can triple or quadruple your uh, latency with an impact performance of your database uh, queries uh, server. Right? So, if you can minimize number of hops, this is great. Ensure you are running at least one gigabit uh, link speed at the very least. And that means you have to have the card, you have to have proper switches, and you have to be configured properly. I would be surprised, uh, or I was surprised how frequently we found some problems here, right? Even right now, when gigabit was out for many, many years, some people are not running gigabit, not running full duplex, or uh, have some other configurations. And we see also 10 gigabits uh, is getting popular, uh, especially as a back, uh, backbone, which uh, which uh, gives us a lot of extra bandwidth and uh, a little bit of performance in their in the latency. Now, uh, other thing with networks, uh, of course, uh, you probably would care about uh, high availability, right, and extra performance. Uh, as such, you would recommend to set up you uh, their bonded network if you get this couple of network adapters and redundant switches if you have a chance, right? That's pretty basic network engineering uh, pattern. And what you also want to do is you want to monitor for packet, packet loss, network errors, and uh, uh, low-level latency within uh, your devices. 
uh, I think that's very important because we have seen in so many cases the database being blamed for what was really a network issue. Right? You want to, to see very clearly if application says I'm getting bad response from database, you can see if those are coming from network overload, packet loss, right, or any other uh, situations. Network tuning. Well, I uh, simply go into this number of parameters that you want to, uh, to investigate. Uh, there are, uh, the in, in a lot of cases, uh, or for normal MySQL loads, we don't really do any network tuning. It works pretty well out of the box. Sometimes for some heavy workload and other advanced cases, you may want to uh, do certain tuning, and that's going to be uh, workload uh, specific. Some other things which uh, can be important with MySQL to uh, minimize the impact of network could be to investigate persistent connections, especially if you have uh, uh, tiny uh, transactions like you connect a couple of queries, disconnect. It's connecting disconnected, which may be their uh, main load on, on your system. Right? So uh, consider that. Uh, using the thread pool in MySQL Enterprise uh, Edition in Kahana Server in, uh, in MariaDB can also be a very good idea if you have very large, large number of, uh, of concurrent connections going into thousands of tens of thousands. And also you can use a, a, a MySQL proxy to multiplex connections if you uh, want persistent connections but you can't really afford to have so many connections uh, coming to a single database. Now, visualization. Uh, every year I talk to MySQL crowds, I see more and more running MySQL uh, in a virtualized uh, world. Right? So this is uh, happening, they're getting a lot and more, uh, more uh, virtualization. You just have to, important to understand what uh, virtualization is a tool which helps us with uh, manageability, maybe the resource usage and other things, but uh, this tool which comes at at cost, right? Virtualization has overhead and that can range from a few percent to 20-30% uh, plus, right? Depending on the workload and this may or may not be important uh, to you. What you also see in cloud and uh, also in all the virtualized environments is uh, you really get a very large instance size. Typically, uh, you get a medium uh, amount of CPUs, memory, uh, and you can get a lot more with um, uh, non-virtualized uh, hardware. And I think uh, that's fine, it just has to be accounted for in your performance and uh, scalability uh, practices, right? Otherwise, there is a lot of MySQL run those days in the cloud or on virtualized environment and it's uh, working fine, fine. So now let's talk in more details in the Linux um, configuration. And I would uh, iterate again is for most workloads, if you are just taking the Linux default install, almost default install, right, running MySQL on it, it runs surprisingly well. In a lot of uh, workloads that is already good enough, but uh, in some more advanced uh, workloads you may need to do some uh, tuning. What things you may be looking at here? Uh, first is SE Linux and uh, up, um, uh, up armor to a la later extent. Now there is actually a, a lot of, um, this is a little bit controversial topics, right? There are some uh, security people who really love uh, those technologies and really would uh, hate to disable that. There are others who have been beaten up by a lot of operational complexities uh, by having them uh, enabled and they uh, like to uh, disable them. From a performance standpoint, uh, SE Linux can essentially especially provide large overhead which can be up to 10% or uh, even more. So. I would uh, recommend as follows, right? Ask yourself if you are using SE Linux or something, right? Or if don't, uh, disable it because uh, it, 
it will be overhead uh, which uh, gives you no additional benefits uh, otherwise. Another important thing at MySQL uh, is you may see it swapping in some workloads and we want to reduce and tendency to swap because swapping is very, very bad for uh, database workloads. We can do that by setting their swappiness to zero, right? Uh, and also not forgetting to lower our VM duty ratio because we don't want uh, MySQL to use all their or Linux to use too much of our memory for uh, buffer and writes, and because of that, push uh, MySQL buffer pull up memory. Another uh, the, the issue is what uh, you uh, may have some problems which are caused by the NUMA of uh, our uh, current systems. And if you look at the uh, modern servers, they all have their uh, NUMA architecture, which essentially means that uh, 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 essentially all multi-socket systems have a NUMA architecture. That means is what different uh, CPU sockets have a different uh, access speed to their local memory, which is kind of connected to their local socket and remote memory. And MySQL uh, uh, and a operating system takes advantage of that, but what that can also cause in some cases is what your uh, bar pool will be just allocated on only one of the nodes and um, uh, to use appropriately. Uh, uh, the best way uh, to do that is to enable uh, interleaving, which you can do with NumaCTL, or if you're running Percona, uh, Percona server is an option you can use for uh, startup scripts. Uh, thinking about their storage configuration, I would suggest to separate the operating system MySQL partition. So, uh, if you ever have to do something with the operating system or, or if your operating system log fill up a space, you never have a MySQL partition um, impacted right? uh, because of that. Or maybe you just want to reinstall OS and keep a MySQL partition uh, intact to use some uh, different file system and so on and so forth. There is a good uh, reason to do that. In a lot of cases, we also would put their uh, some logs on the uh, that operating system partition. I/O scheduler. That is another important uh, point. The uh, I/O scheduler is something which is responsible for scheduling uh, how the I/O is done for your uh, devices. And there, in many cases, you will see CFQ uh, is uh, scheduled by default, which can cause performance problems. Uh, there, we find the deadline or even not of Often being a better scheduler for uh, for MySQL. You can also mm, uh, often, especially for MySQL, want to increase the amount of uh, requests the device can have in your queue. That can uh, really allow device to optimize uh, writes uh, in uh, mm, a lot more efficiently. I also like to set up a MySQL with uh, with with uh, LVM. Uh, some critique for LVM comes where it, it can have some overhead if you create a snapshot. And that's indeed true, especially for conventional uh, storage, not for solid state drives. But at the same time, if you're not taking a snapshot, then you wouldn't have a lot of uh, overhead uh, at all. And I really like having uh, LVM for extra flexibility for me to take a snapshot which I can use for a number of reasons for backups, for uh, let's say testing out something, you know, I can create a snapshot to upgrade MySQL and if that MySQL upgrades uh, will just kill the MySQL with some reason and corrupt the database, well, I can go back uh, using the LVM snapshot very easily and much faster than restoring very large database from backup. File systems, that is another a uh, very common question we hear. Well, uh, they're all the kind of high performance favorite file system, which we use a lot, is XFS. Uh, over the last two years, we see increasingly uh, good results with ext 4 uh, uh, which can uh, even be faster than XFS for some workloads. And I would try and focus on those two file systems at this point. File systems you don't probably want to do is ext 2 as 
it's not transaction at all. Uh, EXT3, because, well, uh, it has a lot of performance limitation, Razor FS for mm. obvious reason. ZFS on Linux, right? We're speaking on Linux. Uh, we have seen a number of problems ha uh, having that in heavy production use. At the same time, we have a lot of very good success stories using that in development, right? For example, some storage array which the which ZFS may allow you to provide essentially full multiple terabyte database to copy to each of your developers, right, to play with, uh, where deduplication, right, and uh, storage sharing can be used to really that not take a lot of space and developers being able to play with the database and if you screwed up, they can create a new ZFS snapshot and continue working on that, right? So that can be very powerful. We also have seen that used in some uh, back, uh, backup environment and something else. And uh, ButterFS, uh, that also looks promising, but I wouldn't uh, put that in their uh, database for time use. Few type of file system which you want to do. Use real time or no time mount option. That uh, can help, especially if you have a lot of uh, a lot of files uh, with the database. Uh, for ext 3 ext 4 we want to uh, make sure we uh, tune file system to enable uh, your index which can help us as well as um, uh, I like to uh, remove those 5% resorts for root because it doesn't really send, make sense for my school which you already run on the not, not user. And uh, I also like to have a behavior called remote RO. I don't want my database, if there's any database that consists of discovery, I don't want a uh, system to continue, right, to spread those uh, corruption. That um, doesn't make much sense. And uh, for XFS, if you have a RAID with battery backup cache or flash, you often may want to uh, uh, mount no very option for, uh, for better performance. Now let me talk briefly about the MySQL variants which exist out there. Now your main choices would be MySQL, Performance Server, and uh, and uh, and MariaDB, uh, obviously. And uh, all those projects they have a little bit uh, uh, different focus, right? Where uh, MySQL is uh, obviously their uh, baseline, which uh, all other folks use in the MySQL 5.6. I think is a pretty uh, good release if a lot of uh, users very happy with uh, its performance and the features out there. With uh, with your corner server, which is also available as GA those days, we provide a lot uh, more uh, focus in uh, even uh, better performance, especially at their for the mining application as well as virus operational improvements and transparency. And with MariaDB, often you would find some uh, very uh, advanced uh, features which you may not find in their other MySQL variants, right? Like you know, there is a more advanced optimizer or integration with Cassandra storage engine and uh, thing, uh, things like that. Though many of those are only available in uh, in the version 10.0, which is not uh, not J8 yet. In a nutshell. All the new version for any MySQL variant scale better, right? Wherever you will uh, take. Uh, I would say with MySQL uh, 5.6, the corner server 5.6 is uh, GA now, it works pretty well. Uh, we would uh, suggest you to use that for new, new development if, uh, if you are just taking to have any new MySQL install. And in terms of MySQL, uh, upgrade. Uh, I would suggest you to upgrade. It's safe to upgrade it now if you need it, if you can benefit from some features or if you need performance improvements and or other improvements MySQL 5 to 6 can offer or uh, you can safely still uh, stay on MySQL 5, 5 uh, for uh, I would say a another year to two years that is still uh, a release which is very common out there and that's uh, very well uh, supported by, by ourselves and uh, other companies how do we want to uh, how do we want to install uh, their the MySQL version? Uh, well, 
Uh, my uh, suggestions would be to use uh, use repositories, right? Uh, I uh, mentioned repositories for, from Perfona, but they provide that uh, MariaDB and Oracle, they both provide the repositories for most common distributions uh, those days. Uh, this is great because that uh, allows uh, you to install the software and upgrading the software with a single, uh, single click of the mouse, essentially. The next best choice is to get some packages which could be Debian uh, packages or RPMs. Uh, in some cases, then you, uh, especially with my school uh, sandbox, when I am testing different uh, versions, right? For uh, using target zip package is good for that, or for some advanced deployment things, when you want, let's say, self-contained MySQL install, where you want several of them to be in a single MySQL. And also some people uh, build your own. Well, I would say uh, unless you really know what you're doing and you are patching MySQL or doing something like that, uh, I would suggest you to uh, really avoid that because there, there, there is a lot out there in terms of compiling version, compiler version you're using, uh, compiler settings and so on and so forth. And uh, it is unlikely you will be able to test your self-build MySQL version as well as uh, their uh, uh, commonly used MySQL uh, builds are tested. So don't compile MySQL yourself unless you really have some good reason to do that. The next thing which comes to MySQL is obviously MySQL configuration. Uh, the thing to know is you will need to tune MySQL configuration. I told you Linux configuration, it works reasonably well with defaults, right? Not so with MySQL. Even if I, with 5.6, if you are looking for uh, serious MySQL usage, don't run it with default. So uh, there is a, a link I provide to you for, uh, which goes in depth on uh, MySQL configuration tuning for, uh, for 5.6. And I will only provide a very few variables which are most important to get you uh, uh, some uh, uh, good performance. And in the majority of the cases you have very few variables you need to tune to get you uh, uh, where you need to be. The most popular four variables that I will mention is in a debugger pool size. This is the most important variable uh, option, right? You want to give energy plenty of memory for cache and other needs for it to be performing well. And in a debugger pool size is the thing what you buy your memory for. You set it for 80% or sometimes uh, even more of your total memory size uh, if you're using uh, InnoDB alone. In the flash method or direct, also uh, uh, quite uh, important. So you want to avoid double buffering in the operating system and in a DB. Uh, you also want to set in the develop file size to uh, higher values. I would say at least 256 megabytes or significantly more if you can afford. The thing to remain uh, to note here is if you have larger logs, you get longer recovery time. And there is no right answer here. You have to test that with your system because depending on your workload, uh, recovery time will vary greatly. I cannot just say, hey, well, it's one gigabyte log file means one hour of recovery time. Right. It's really, really application dependent. You also want to change it uh, to tune the Indie Flash Low with TRX commits. The rule for that is if you want a truly ace and durable configuration, you want to set that to one. At the same time, if uh, you can afford loading uh, transactions for last second uh, or so and you don't have very, very high performance storage, right, uh, and so on, then you may want to set that to two which will not cause a database crash, corruption, but if you have a full system crash, you may uh, lose some of your uh, transactions for the last few seconds, right? So that is a, a, the most important trade-off here. Let's talk now about some uh, advanced ideas uh, that which you can uh, think about. Running multiple MySQL instances. Well, that actually can be a, uh, can be a good idea for uh, for some 
So that, uh, or for some cases, you can maybe uh, able to get a better utilization for from your system. If you're using that, we often like to use a task set to uh, to map different instances to a different CPU cores, especially if they have uh, sustained workloads uh, all the time. Memory allocation. The memory allocation can be uh, a hot spot and uh, and limit their uh, the, and the performance bottleneck. You can use gmalloc or gcmalloc uh, allocation libraries for that. Uh, for uh, Grafana server, we provide uh, an uh, easy way you can install gmalloc and use that with it, which uh, can be good. LVM snapshot. I also mentioned that. Uh, uh, briefly, is what, what's uh, beyond the typical way of people using that for backups. I believe it's a very uh, good trick you can use for uh, maintenance and upgrade, providing you the extra safety net so you can go back if things go wrong without necessary uh, restore and pull back. Backup. Other thing uh, you need to know. Uh, about uh, Linux is for a lot of distributions, your MySQL start, stop scripts can be can be pretty nasty, and you can get into uh, problems with them. Uh, things you need to be aware of is first is timeouts. Sometimes those timeouts, or uh, how long scripts wait for the database to uh, be shut down, may not be quick enough, right? And you may want whenever you run. Uh, let's say MySQL stop and you're getting the timeout or you want to check if the MySQL was actually done and there is no MySQL deep process in the process list before, let's say, rebooting the server. Some of the scripts, uh, like the uh, Debian, they have an automatic upgrade check tool which may check all tables uh, then if you start MySQL, which may be surprising for you and which may cause some operational problems, right, because some tables may be locked. And you you may want to change that to uh, control it manually. Also with uh, Debian again, the DBKG uh, has an interesting setup for a post and install uh, scripts, which it will try to configure the packages if they haven't been what the thing configured properly. Uh, what you have often seen with that is uh, you install their MySQL uh, or Perfona server, right, so wherever, and uh, you can use it, but it did and it thinks it's not having been configured properly. Then you will go and upgrade, for example, Postfix, and it will discover, oh, uh, the Perfona server wasn't configured properly, so let me shut it down and restart it to perform a configuration of that. So, Maintenance on some absolutely unrelated package may make a package manager to shut down your MySQL server. Just be aware of that. That can be pretty nasty, and uh, uh, the, the, there are some workarounds to disable that uh, behavior. But the best is to make sure what your MySQL related packages are well configured uh, before you uh, continue. The next thing important is automation. But if you're running MySQL on the lighter scale, their manual approach wouldn't scale, and it's also error prone. You will get some things done on one server and not on another server. So you want to think about automating your uh, installation, upgrades, uh, uh, configuration when you run MySQL on large scale. There are a number of good tools out there. You can use Packet, you can use Shred, Ansible, and some, uh, uh, some others. If you don't use some of those fancy tools, at least keep your configuration under MySQL configuration after and other system configuration under version control, so you can know what you have changed and why and track the changes. At the very least, right? If you hate version control systems, put the comments in the MySQL config file saying, "Oh, I have." Uh, change that variable from X to Z on this date because of this wonderful article I found in Google. Right? It, it can help with the troubles of performance later. Another question what we always say uh, here with Ryan MySQL and Linux is how do I monitor and train my MySQL? Well, there are many tools to choose from 
And the chances are uh, the two you are already using as some support of MySQL plugins, and they may be good enough for basic monitoring training class. Just make sure you are uh, uh, using those. If you don't have, have something, I would suggest you to, to check their uh, Nigus and Time. We have their uh, monitoring plugins for those platforms which allow you to get the most important graphs and uh, also monitoring uh, plugins for uh, Nagios. And what is especially good about the Nagios plugins is you can typically use them with a lot of stuff out there. A lot of other monitoring tools are able to work with uh, Nagios plugins which can start out there. Uh, I also like uh, the Graphite a lot, which is a great tool for uh, working with the graphs and performing some advanced analysis. You can check that out. Other um, operational issues. We often would see uh, something happens and uh, more memory than you intend has allocated and Linux out of memory killer is triggered. Well, it's good to play defense and configure things properly, right, and uh, allocate plenty of swap space uh, so it doesn't happen. But I also like to have an extra uh, defense here to make sure if that doesn't help and I still have something which allocates too much memory, I uh, configure the system properly so things that I want to be killed are killed. In my view of priorities, I want, and as I say, Or something, right, and I well, at least understand what's going on, then I would put their MySQL server, where which typically I don't want to be killed because that's what this server does. And then the third priority, I would put various jobs, backups, uh, some background, that job, they're on a toolkit run, because, well, if they get killed, they can be restarted with uh, lesser impact to, to production. Uh, to play with that, you can mm, uh, work with uh, OM hash variable for a given uh, process, which you can range from 70 to minus 70 to don't ever kill to having some higher values than uh, default, uh, zero, to have a process more likely to be killed if uh, systems comes up to uh, after memory pressure. If you are uh, doing uh, a lot of um, uh, work with MySQL, there are a number of tools, system tools, which uh, I would suggest you to be familiar with. Uh, VMstat, IOStat, Talk, tools come with uh, any uh, linear distributions out there which can be very helpful to understand what's going on with the system. S-Trace is a boring tool, but we often use that to understand uh, the interaction of MySQL with operation system if something goes wrong. Worry though, what S trace on running MySQL process will be intrusive, right? It will uh, impact things. Oprofile is very good for profiling CPU usage both inside a MySQL database and the kernel. GDB, we use that for uh, some performance uh, troubleshooting and also to deal with uh, understanding why crash happens. But again, running JDB on the running uh, process of MySQL. Uh, is not something you may want to do in uh, the production as it will cause a significant impact. And the tools from Perpona Toolkit is also something you want to familiarize yourself with. Well, uh, as we are getting close to the end uh, of the presentation, I wanted to mention a few important links as to uh, how you can learn more if you're interested in MySQL. Mm -hmm. First is the Percona training. We have a very uh, developed training program uh, and we can provide both uh, public training which you can attend uh, running throughout the world as well as we can uh, and train your company, your team uh, in-house or on their topics which are important for, uh, for your organization. Uh, we have a lot of uh, Percona webinars, both uh, upcoming webinars as well there is uh, tens of uh, webinar recordings available uh, right now for uh, for you to review and uh, you can learn a lot of information from there. The next webinar uh, coming uh, the next week will be about MySQL 5.6. We just uh, was released as a GA a couple of days ago and 
on this graph I want to show you what we are able to get again performance which is a much better and, uh, and uh, superior uh, to um, to MySQL uh, especially on a high uh, volume workload. Sorry about that, I should have uh, disabled that my calendar as well. And uh, the next uh, thing is uh, the online conference which is uh, uh, happening next uh, what is it, uh, next month uh, in London. Uh, that will be uh, a wonderful event with a lot of uh, talks from uh, MySQL experts both from uh, for different MySQL variants for Oracle is participating. We have a lot of talks from Perconer, from our uh, MariaDB team, uh, as well as a lot of the MySQL practitioners from tons of fun points out there. Well, that's it, and uh, thank you for attending. Okay, Peter, thank you very much. There are some and questions. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, great. So yes, there are some questions. I just want to remind the audience to go ahead and type any questions that you have. We'll get to as many as we can in the next few minutes, and those that we don't get to, Peter will address in a follow-up blog post. Um, I just also wanted to point out that for attendees of this webinar, we have a special discount code that was on the previous slide um, that will give you an additional 25 pounds off the advanced registration rate, which ends on October 13th. So take advantage of that to get the extra discount. All right, with that said, Peter, uh, and that is a Webinar UK. So when you're registering, just type that into the promotional space and you get an extra 25 pounds off um, the already discounted advanced rate price. So that's a good deal. All right, so with that said, the questions. Um, Peter, are there any downsides of using Amazon Linux over CentOS on EC2? Yeah, well, uh, I would say there uh, the Amazon Linux is a is a pretty uh, pretty safe choice, right? Uh, especially on uh, if you're running Amazon uh, EC2 because that is a version which uh, Amazon uses, but a lot of the Amazon users use in the EC2 environment, so it's it's pretty well stay uh, used uh, in that space, and we have number of user user uh, number of users using that with a lot of success. So yes, that's fine. Okay, the next question is, what is your take about running MySQL under VMware? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, the answer when this question was uh, asked, I covered the uh, VM briefly, right? And uh, I would say we do a lot of the VM uh, in MySQL for, uh, for testing and development, that's uh, wonderful. But we also see those days a lot of virtualized uh, MySQL run uh, in production, uh, and this is typically uh, environments where some other considerations are more important than, uh, than performance, because there is a still performance overhead which comes with their uh, virtualized MySQL. Okay. Next question is, what about journal data and ODirect on an HA cluster with shared storage FE? On the cluster with shared storage, uh, well, I'm not sure I quite uh, understand the question, right? Because if you look at, their, at the MySQL, MySQL itself, right, uh, you don't, uh, uh, you don't have a shared storage. Right, uh, the, you have to uh, have the different nodes having their own uh, own data sets. Right, so in the in some uh, other technologies, right, they are able to share their data among different databases, right, among different the different um, web servers, right. But it's, uh, that's not using MySQL. Okay, uh, the person who posted the question did a follow up. He said. Um, EXT4 journal data option versus ODirect. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, well, if you look at the journal data versus ODirect, right, well, uh, those things are uh, 
they are uh, different. Well, I think when you speak about their uh, journal data, right, I would imagine you are probably uh, asking about double write, uh, disabling double write buffer uh, and using data join instead. Yes, in theory, there you can use disable double write and use a file system uh, option for data journal uh, instead to provide a database consistency. Uh, in practice, uh, we see using double write and not using uh, data journal for uh, the ext4 is uh, is better option. Okay. The next question is, what about Amazon RDS? What is about uh, Amazon RDS? Well, uh, the, if you are running uh, Amazon RDS, right, you don't really uh, work with the operating system uh, underneath, right? So I would say what we have uh, a substantial number of classes which are running the Amazon uh, the RDS quite, uh, quite successfully. It's, uh, it's ran quite fine, and it it has its uh, its uh, its own set of trade-offs. Uh, from a high level point of view, is if you want to take as little care uh, with your database as possible, you want kind of uh, somebody else is doing for that. Uh, Amazon RDS can be quite good. If you're looking for something more advanced, custom, you want to control over options or uh, to have more uh, flexibility or um, the, you want also like uh, lower cost, right, even by running uh, MySQL EC2, then uh, these are the choices uh, to use different solutions. Okay, Peter, that's it for questions. Um, if there's anything else, um, Go ahead and reach out to Peter on the MySQL performance blog, and I'm sure he'd be very happy to answer your questions. Um, with that said, I'd like to thank Peter and our audience for attending today's presentation. Like Peter said, next week is all about Percona Server 5.6. We're really excited about this and want to share with you all the great um, features and benefits. Um, and give you a chance to ask lots of questions. I will get a recording of this webinar and slides out to everybody within the next 48 hours. And with that said, thank you again for attending. Have a wonderful day, evening, afternoon, wherever you're from. Thank you again. Thank you.